Welcome to Reason and Theology, everyone. I'm your host, Michael Lofton, joined by co-hosts William Albrecht and Eric Ibarra. Pleased to announce that we're having a discussion today with esteemed guest, New Testament scholar and New York Times bestselling author, Dr. Bart Ehrman. Dr. Ehrman, uh, welcome to the show. How are you? Yeah, I'm doing well, thanks. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me. Absolutely. It's it's an honor. And and today what we're doing is we're discussing with you, of course, your recently uh, published book. I want to say it was published uh, early in March, Heaven and Hell, A History of the Afterlife. And so my first question to you about this book is, uh, why exactly did you feel the need to write it? And, and what's the main thrust of this book? Yeah, so um, I, I wrote it for a couple of reasons. One is... Uh, on the personal level, I was uh, I was raised a Christian and always believed in heaven and hell. And uh, when I became a, a conservative evangelical Christian in high school and then uh, on into my early early twenties, and uh, I uh, I was absolutely committed to heaven and hell. Was convinced that uh, if people uh, did not share my uh, my views about God and Christ, they were going to hell. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and those of us who did have the right views were going to go to and were committed to them would be would be going to heaven. Uh, eventually, I left um, I left my evangelical uh, faith and became a liberal Christian for a number of years. And uh, and eventually, I left the faith altogether. And all this time, I, I wondered about you know heaven and hell. And you know if I if I changed my views and I was wrong, you know I was in trouble. Sure. <laughs> and so I, really, and so I got I got very interested for that reason. But the other thing is that it's such an important issue for people generally because everybody wonders what's going to happen when you die. Mm-hmm. And the the common view in America still is that there's a literal heaven and hell. So se- mm-hmm. the latest research poll indicates that seven out of 10 Americans continue to believe in a literal heaven as a place your soul goes when, when, when you die, uh, or uh, six out of 10 believe in a literal hell as mm-hmm. a place that you'll be punished forever. Uh, if you're if you're not on the right side when you die. So the majority of Christians to hold this view and what my book is about is trying to show where these ideas came from and the surprising thesis in the book uh, is that the idea that you die and your soul goes to heaven or hell is found nowhere in the Old Testament and is not what Jesus preached. Mm. And so the question of the book is, well, first of all, I try to show that in the book. But then the question is, well, where'd they come from then? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, that, so that's what the book is about. Well, you know, that, that's curious. Um, so what, what exactly would you say Jesus did preach? Because we, we often hear and we sort of get the impression when we open up the New Testament and read the Gospels that Jesus is the very one teaching um, most about hell when it comes to uh, the New Testament. So um, what exactly would you say that he, he was teaching if uh, so many Christians have misunderstood this teaching? Yeah, I mean, it's a complicated issue. And so it, I actually can't get to Jesus till like you know after a number of chapters in the book because mm-hmm. I have to set the whole thing up right. to explain that that in in uh, in ancient Judaism Jesus of course is a Jew and most ancient Jews didn't believe that you had a soul that could exist after you, your body died uh, they thought that the the soul and the body were they were united. They were united in the sense that they couldn't exist independently of each other. And so, for ancient Jews, the idea was that when when God created Adam, He made Adam out of the dirt, and then He breathed into him, and Adam was as alive as long as he breathed. Mm. But as soon as his breath leaves him, he's no longer alive, and his breath doesn't go anywhere. And that's 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 what we think too about the breath. You know, it's not that the breath exists after you stop breathing. It just doesn't. You know, your body's not alive anymore, so it doesn't breathe. And that's what they thought the soul was. It was this thing that made the body alive, but it didn't exist independently. Eventually, by the time of Jesus, um, in the Old Testament, when people die, that's it. That's you know, they're they're dead. They're they're dead. Uh, by the time of Jesus, some Jews had come to think that there is going to be some kind of future life after death, but it was not that your soul would live on in heaven. Mm. It was that your body would come back to life. Mm-hmm. God would breathe life back into the body, just like he did with Adam. He had made this paradise for Adam, the Garden of, of Eden, and, and Adam and Eve blew it, and they got kicked out. But uh, God is going to return people to this garden if they've been on his side, and he'll mm-hmm. bring people back to life uh, bodily, and they will enter into this paradise here on earth bodily, mm-hmm. And that's where they'll live bodily. So when Jesus talks about the kingdom of God, 
He's not talking about the place your soul goes when it dies. He's talking about the kingdom here on earth that God is going to rule, the paradise that God originally established. Mm -hmm. And so the people who are on God's side will enter into this paradise. The people on the other side, though, the wicked people, they're not going to be tormented forever. They're simply going to be annihilated. They're going to be destroyed. And so only some people will go into the kingdom of God and everybody else will be destroyed. And this is Jesus' consistent teaching throughout the Gospels. The problem is that when people read their New Testaments, they read Jesus talking about hell. And so it sounds like he's talking about hell. Mm -hmm. But the problem is that the word that they're translating is hell. The Greek word does not mean the place that your soul goes when it dies. <laughs> mm -hmm. it's, it, it, it isn't referring to, to eternal torment. And so... Yeah, so I have to. It, it takes a while to develop that in my book, but that's, well, that's the basic piece. There's there's a couple of follow up questions that I have here. One um, would be. It does seem that he still indicates there is a sense in which, for example, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are alive. He says that God is the God of the living. Um, he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's not the God of the dead, but of the living. So even before the resurrection, he seems to still think that they are alive right now. So in what sense did Jesus think that? And then also part B, kind of number two, uh, what do we do with Jesus when he talks about um, Gehenna and, and basically the undying worm and, and, and stuff like that. What do we do with that kind of language? Yeah. So, uh, no, those are really, they're really good questions. And of course they're, they're questions that I have to, uh, have to deal with, uh, right. in my text. Um, let, let me start with Gehenna first because it's, it, yeah. it's, it's the, it's the one people always, always ask about. Yeah. Um, so Gehenna, so th this is the this is the Greek word that often gets translated as hell in English Bible translations. Some some will translate it as Gehenna, but most Bible translators don't want to translate the word Gehenna as Gehenna because nobody knows what Gehenna is. And so, like, if you're putting it in English, you got to pick a word, right? right? And so, so Gehenna is actually it is not a place of torment where your soul goes. Gehenna is known from the Old Testament. Uh, it is a valley outside of Jerusalem that was used, um, that, that was understood to be a desecrated place. It was an unholy place that Israelites despised and hated, the, many did, because in the Old Testament, it was a place that some Israelites used to practice human sacrifice in. And so God, it was like this God-forsaken valley. What Jesus says is that if you are wicked, um, you will. Uh, you are in danger of having your corpse thrown into this desecrated valley. Now, for people today, most people today, you know, they want a decent burial, and that's why you get life insurance and stuff, so you can get a burial. And you, you know, people want to have a ritual. And they want to write. It's one part. Part of the terrible thing now with the crisis is people can't mourn in a burial, and people think I'm going to die, and nobody's even going to notice. And so that's bad. In the ancient world, it was much worse. Not having a decent burial was just about the worst thing that could happen to you. And Jesus is saying in these passages that if you're wicked, you're not only not going to get a decent burial, your corpse is going to be tossed into this God-forsaken valley, and that's where your remains are going to end up. And the worm never dies there, and the fires never cease. What he means is that this place is this awful place that is not going away. He does not say that souls are going to be tormented in fire forever. He doesn't say that the souls last forever, the fire lasts forever. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you know, when you burn somebody at the stake in the ancient world or, you know, in the 19th century or whenever they were burning people at the stake, you burn mm -hmm. somebody at the stake, the, the person dies. <laughs> That's how you kill the person. The fire goes on, but it doesn't matter how long the fire goes on. The person is dead. And so mm. Jesus is saying the fire is going to go on. Well, yeah, yeah, that's right. But, you know, you're going to be dead. Mm. Uh, and so the Gehenna thing is uh, is a complete misunderstanding. There's nothing about the soul living on to be tormented uh, in the teachings of Jesus. What about the idea that people uh, still have uh, life? Mm -hmm. This is where we get, this is where it gets complicated. And it's the kind of thing that is a little bit hard to explain <laughs> in a sound bite. Sure, uh, sure. <laughs> because it, it takes an entire book to kind of explain right. it. But there are a lot of sayings of Jesus in the New Testament, of course, and scholars for several hundred years have realized that some of the things Jesus said in the Gospels are not things that Jesus really said, the historical mm -hmm. Jesus said. Mm -hmm. 
that the Gospels are recording sayings of Jesus that are not necessarily things he said. And so the task of scholarship is to figure out which is which. Mm -hmm. You know, if Jesus says, you know, uh, I am, you know, uh, be before Abraham was, I am. You know, did right. Jesus really say that or not? You know, how do you decide? And so this is the kind of thing scholars do. Right. Um, there are passages in the New Testament where Jesus seems to affirm ongoing life right after mm -hmm. death. Uh, these are in the later Gospels. They're not in the earlier Gospels. And th so it's a complicated, complicated issue. Yeah. Jesus yeah. did believe that God was the God of the living. But in the context in which he says that, it's in reference to the future resurrection of the dead, meaning mm -hmm. bodies coming back to life. Yeah. God rules over living beings, not dead beings. Okay, so but you're effectively yeah. saying from a text critical perspective that it would, um, you know, it, it would seem that some of these other passages perhaps were um, not necessarily original to Jesus, but perhaps were um, added by later disciples or later Christians. But then my question is, well, these were things that were delivered to a community. These were things that, you know, the, the community, uh, the covenant community had heard. They had listened to Jesus preach. Wouldn't they have immediately said, hey, wait. Jesus didn't say that. He didn't teach this. He, he didn't uh, believe this doctrine. Wouldn't there have been a, a, an immediate outcry on part of Christians who had heard the words of Jesus orally? Um, and, and we would find evidence of it, just as we find you know, evidence of the apostolic fathers and their writings and so on. What, what would you say about that? So I think the important thing to remember is that the Gospels we have were not delivered to people who heard Jesus preaching. Um, Jesus, uh, Jesus lived in Galilee. It's where his public ministry was. Um, he, uh, his followers were from that area. The followers and Jesus all spoke Aramaic. Um, they were not world travelers. Um, they, uh, they were, they were the, the people who listened to Jesus during his ministry were country folk. Uh, the town Jesus came from, Nazareth, was a tiny little hamlet. It wasn't a big city. Jesus never visits big cities uh, in the Gospels. The big cities in his area are uh, were Tiberias and uh, Sepphoris, and he never visits either one. Uh, he goes to small towns and small villages and outside areas, uh, and he speaks in Aramaic. The Gospels are not written to those contexts. Uh, our first Gospel was almost certainly the Gospel of Mark. Uh, it was written probably sometime around the year 70, of the common era. Jesus died in the year 30, so that his uh, preaching ministry was probably in the late 20s, uh, which means that Mark's gospel is probably uh, just over 40 years after Jesus was alive and teaching. 40 years later, Jesus' eyewitnesses uh, probably themselves were not alive because life, life expectancy is not very long in the ancient world. So the people who are reading the gospels would not have been born yet, probably, when Jesus uh, was ministering but more important the gospels are not written in, in israel they're written outside of israel and they're not written in aramaic they're written in greek uh originally written in greek and so they're written for audiences of people who had never never been around jesus had never heard jesus preach and so they um you know so so the problem you're posing would be a problem mm -hmm. If you had uh, these gospels written, you know, like a year after he died yeah. to the people living in Galilee, but but they're written 40, 50, 60 years later and yeah. to, to other people. And, 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 and that makes yeah. sense. But I, I imagine that, you know, um, some of the communities in Asia Minor uh, that were reading these uh, these epistles and uh, gospels and things like that, different communities. Um, perhaps they were not necessarily eyewitnesses of Christ, but they knew people who were. Uh, Polycop, for example, knowing John. Um, so w what would you say in regards to them? When, whenever the Gnostics came uh, with their fake Gospels, people immediately in those communities reacted to it and say, said that this isn't what was handed on to us by those who did know the Apostles and were their, essentially were their successors. So um, wouldn't they have, at, at least one step removed, wouldn't they have recognized the problems? Uh, well, they may they may well have. We don't we don't know, uh, because the early authors don't tell us anything about that. I mean, just to take Polycarp for example, we don't really know uh, what Polycarp's background was. 
there's a there's a story at the end of the second century that Polycarp was a disciple of John. Mm-hmm. Well, um, when you uh, read what Polycarp actually wrote, uh, so we have a letter. We have a letter by Polycarp. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not quite clear when to date the letter, um, but um, it's often thought to date uh, at the earliest in the middle of the 130s. Uh, so that would be 100 years after Jesus' death, over 100 years, probably 110 years after Jesus' death. Um, in Polycarp's letter, he quotes, uh, he, he, he seems to quote earlier Christian writings. He doesn't say anything about Jesus' view of the afterlife. And this is interesting for the point you made about him knowing John. He quotes what appears to quote Matthew, Mark, and Luke. He never quotes or refers to John. Mm. And that's weird if mm-hmm. he really was a disciple of John. <laughs> right. Sure. 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 So, yeah. so, so like every instance you can come up with like that, like this, you're going to have the same problem. Yeah. There's don't have, you don't have any early Christian uh, writers who tell us that they knew anybody from the original communities. The closest thing we get is uh, somebody named Papias. Sure. Who was right writing around the year, maybe around the year 130. It's debated. Was it 120? Was it 140? We don't know what year he's writing. He wrote yeah. this large five volume book. We would love to have this five volumes, but we don't have yeah. we just have little snippets of them that right. remain. The what he says is that he he had interviewed people who had known the followers of Jesus disciples. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So he's got it for hand and that's the earth that's the best we've got. And, and he's somewhat problematic have, because have, we just don't have people who yeah. could have said, well, that isn't what Jesus said because I heard him. You know, we just don't have that. And, and and he's kind of a problematic case anyway because he seems to be a keelist, which is something that the early Christian community tended to reject. So uh, <laughs> they later rejected it, but early on, of course, it was the main view. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, I, I want to ask um, another kind of follow up with what we were talking about um, earlier, because I, I would love to continue to go down this direction, but I kind of want to return to your book. Um, you were engaging the text of Daniel and you in your book and you were discussing uh, the afterlife there in the book of Daniel and you discuss the resurrection of the dead, that this appears to be the case where uh, it's explicitly taught by Jews. Now, when we look at the passage in Daniel, it not only indicates those who uh, rise to eternal life, but it also indicates there are some who rise to eternal death, if you will. Um, Would you say that's annihilation? Uh, In the eyes of the author of the book of Daniel, he's indicating that these people who rise to eternal death, that they are going to be annihilated, or is this something that is going to be conscious uh, for them? People who are dead are unconscious because they're dead. What Daniel does not say is that they will be risen to be tormented forever. Mm Mm-hmm. But he, he does make a connection with some of the language that's used there in Daniel. He does make a connection with the passage that we see in Isaiah. Uh, I, I want to say it's 64, 66, somewhere around there, uh, about the undying worm and, and so on. And that part does appear to be conscious in the afterlife. Would you disagree with that? Yes. Okay. Isaiah doesn't say anything about people being alive forever. He says that, uh, that there's this place where the worm won't die. Okay. <laughs> And so okay. and Daniel doesn't mention the worm or the fire. What he says is that the people will will be raised. Some will live for other, ever, and some will be um, will 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 uh, the word. Is, I'm not sure how to put it, make a verb out of it. Well, mm-hmm. they'll be this is the verb. They'll be despised forever. Mm-hmm. They'll, they'll rise to everlasting contempt. Is what he says. Yeah. But the thing is, you know, he, that doesn't mean that they're alive. It means that people despise them. But mm-hmm. just like Hitler is held in contempt and will be forever, but it doesn't mean he's alive. <laughs> so, right. so Daniel precisely doesn't say this per- these people will be alive forever. If he had wanted to say they'll be tormented forever, that's what he would have said. Mm. You know, but can you maybe elaborate just a little bit more on the undying worm? Um, in, in what way is can we apply that to somebody who is not conscious of their eternal state? In what way yeah. is the worm undying for them? Yeah, it's you know okay. So the basic line is in the Bible. You've got you've got to understand how metaphors work in the Bible, mm-hmm. and and how figurative language works in the Bible. For example, 
um, in the Old Testament, we're told that when the nation of Edom is destroyed, this is the neighbor of Israel that are considered to be wicked, and God's going to wipe them out, that their smoke, the smoke from their destruction will rise forever. Right. Well, nobody really thinks that if you go to Israel today and look at where Edom is, you're going to see, still see the smoke rising. Right. Right? Sure, sure. It, it, it's a metaphor saying sure. that this is a permanent destruction. And that's when, when you say the worm will never die, what you're saying mm -hmm. is this is a permanent destruction. That's, that's why Jesus that's why Jesus says, you know, when in the in the parable of the sheep and the goats, for example, he sends the uh, sends the sheep into eternal life and the goats into eternal punishment. And people say, Oh, well, that must mean they're being tormented forever. No, it means that the punishment never ends. And if you are annihilated, your punishment never ends. It is it is never ending. It's eternal. It's an eternal punishment. You know, there's uh, there's one more question that I want to ask, and then I want to uh, pass it over to William, and then after that, uh, Eric is going to ask some questions. So after that round, maybe I'll ask just a few more after. But I, I want to ask one more uh, before I pass it over. You uh, engage, of course, St. Augustine, and also St. Gregory of Nyssa. Um, can you maybe con compare and contrast their views? Uh, is there a pretty stark difference between Augustine's understanding of the afterlife versus... Um, a potential apocatastasis, if you will, uh, in Gregory of Nyssa. Can uh, maybe explain that for us? Now, how many of your viewers know apocatastasis? <laughs> <laughs> we, we discuss it a little bit on the show. So, <laughs> really? Oh yeah, my God. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, for those of you who don't know this term, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Right. So, Gregory Gregory is a follower of the great uh, philosopher Origen. Mm -hmm. uh, Origen, I think, without a doubt, was the greatest philosopher of the first 300 years of Christianity. And Origen developed um, 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 this doctrine of apokatastasis, which means the word, it's a Greek word that means something like restoration. Right. And the idea that Origen had was that in, in brief form, because, you know, it's, but in sure. brief form, the idea of Origen was that God ultimately is the sovereign over the entire universe. He created the universe. He is the Lord Almighty, and nobody can resist his will. People can try to resist, and they can succeed for a while, but over time, God has a way of persuading people. And um, so that even if people don't repent in this age, they're going to have another chance in another age. And the ages are going to go on for age after age after age. So the history of our world now, this is one age, and there are going to be like millions of these things until finally everybody realizes that God is right, they were wrong, and everybody will come over, and everybody then will worship Christ as the New Testament, as everyone will. And that means if you worship Christ, you will be saved. Mm -hmm. And so Origen taught that everyone, everything's going to be saved. And Gregory of Nyssa agreed with that. Mm. Um, uh, not too many people agreed with it. Yeah. And you know, Origen had this idea of reincarnation. You're actually going to have some kind of reincarnation. And that was a very marginal view, but it's a very interesting view. Some people right. think, you know, this is like the common view in early Christianity. It was not. But right. you did have this view. Augustine had completely the opposite side of it. And uh, Augustine was the greatest theologian of all time. <laughs> I sure, mean, sure. If, you, if you exclude, you know, the Apostle Paul. But in right. terms of a thinking theologian, Augustine is. Yep. Oh, yeah. And he completely disagreed uh, on this. In right. his, his one, of, one of his major books, probably his magnum opus, was The City of God. Mm -hmm. And in the final, it's a very large book, and at the end, end of it, he... Um, he talked about uh, whether there's eternal torment, and he thinks, yes, absolutely. If people are rewarded forever for being righteous, then people who are unrighteous are going to be punished forever. Mm -hmm. And when, when the Bible says it's eternal, it means it's eternal. And he goes through a list of seven groups that deny eternal punishment, right. and he, including origin, starting with origin and kind of going from there. And he says, no, these people are wrong. They're misreading yeah. the Bible. It is eternal. And Augustine's view, obviously, is the one that won out. Yeah, the the massa damnata. Yeah, he, he seemed to uh, go pretty hard a, a against the group. I think they were called the misericordias or, or something like that. The uh, those who you know basically were were wanting to have mercy on the uh, souls yeah. in the afterlife. So yeah, he he went after them pretty hard. It seems. Yeah, he he, he, he doesn't hold any 
punch it, pull any punches. Right. And he, you know, he calls them. He kind of considers them to be kind of pathetically compassionate. You know, it, exactly. <laughs> they're too interested in compassion and not not interested enough in the judgment of God. The right. Guys are really into the judgment of God. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Okay, well, let me pass it over to William. Let me give him a chance to engage you. Thank you so much for uh, dialogue. Thank you. Yeah, you good, great questions. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Dr. Ehrman, I've really, really enjoyed uh, the discussion thus far. I really enjoy your book. Um, I have the book on Kindle, and I have it um, on Audible right there. Ah, Dr. Okay. Ehrman, really, my only complaint would be you should have narrated the whole thing. It would have ah, been incredible. Ah. Great, uh, you did do the preface, though. Uh, the great, great book. I love I love hearing it. Um, of course, I don't agree with everything you say there, but that's the na- the, that is the nature of things. I appreciate the the tone in which you take when you uh, tackle heaven and hell. You even t- touch upon purgatory, which is great, great, great stuff you have there. I wonder what would you what would you say when we look at the Book of Judith? To me, I look at Judith when it's hearkening to actually Mark nine. Is hearkening to Judith, which says, Woe to the nations that rise up against my people. The Lord Almighty will take vengeance on them in the day of judgment. He will send fire and worms into their flesh, and they will weep in pain forever. Do would you how would you interpret that? Is that is that a kind of end times uh, eternal kind of torment that they are going to be undergoing? The way that I look at it. And the way I've seen the early fathers look at it is that they look at the imagery being given in the book of Judith and they say, okay, the people are going to be weeping in pain eternally. How, how would you interpret that? Clearly, I believe Judith, uh, I, I believe Mark would be hearkening to, to Judith there. Uh, I don't know about Mark hearkening to Judith there. Uh, there are a couple things I'll say. I mean, Judith, of course, is not in the, uh, so, uh, I mean, it's, it's one of the apocrypha. Uh, and or Deuterocanonists, as we would call them, though. The Deuterocanon. What I forget yeah. what denomination you are. I'm Catholic. You're Catholic. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's fair enough. Um, it's not clear to me how much. Okay. Uh, let me say a couple of things. One is Judaism in the ancient world was no more of a monolith than Judaism is today. Right. In other words, you know, I often have people ask me, "What do Jews think about this?" Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. What do Americans think about mm-hmm. this? I mean, you know, it's like, which American are you talking to? And you yeah. know, you can't say Jew. This is what Jews believe. Jews believe lots of things, and it was true in the ancient world too. Some some Jews um, uh, in the days of Jesus believed, uh, for example, that um, m- most Jews believe. I, I don't know what most Jews believe. Many Jews believe that death was the end of the story and people just didn't exist after they died. Many Jews, probably the majority that we can tell, believed in a future resurrection of the dead, that bodies would come back to life, but souls don't live separately. And we do, we absolutely do know of Jews who thought that souls lived on after death in Jesus' day. And so, uh, as I point out in my book, I might mean, talk about, for example, First Enoch, uh, that, has, that has this point of view. And First Enoch would have been a more popular book in Jesus' day than, than, Jude, than Judith was. Um, but, uh, but so there were, there are a range of views. So I have no trouble with Judith saying one thing or the other. And so, uh, the, I, I haven't actually studied that passage very closely, uh, in its original okay. language. And so I'd have to do that, but, gotcha. it, but I don't know of much evidence that, that Mark, the gospel of Mark is dependent on, uh, on Judith. I think it, it is very similar in the Greek and, and, and I, maybe if you, if you do good, time to look at that later which which passage in mark are you talking mark about? Ni- mark 948 so what i would say is that intertexts are problematic for interpretation okay. so an intertext is when somebody quotes a text um and then and then like reflects it they aren't necessarily meaning the same thing that the original text mm-hmm. said uh you see what I mean? In other words, oh, when, yeah. oh no doubt, no doubt. Yeah, yeah. When, when somebody today says that uh, people, that souls are going to go to hell and be punished forever because Jesus says you're going to be cast into Gehenna, they're referring to something Jesus said, but it doesn't mean that they're correctly understanding what Jesus said. Oh, and right. So, no, 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 no doubt. Uh, I would, I would argue that if we look at Mark nine, we can we notice there is some variance there in language. But when I then look at Judith, I, I, I'm wondering: is there any way we can look at Judith? And really, look because I'm particularly hearkening to Judith because, as you know well, 
even if we look at evangelicals who, who will deny the canonicity of Judith, you can't deny that it was considered canonical in the early church. They, they quoted well, it. Yes, I think Holy you could deny that. How would you deny that? You have it in, in all was, of the early was, councils. What? You have it in every single early council. You have it in Hippo. You have it in Rome. You have it in Carthage. You have it in, in pretty much every time they gather. Those are, or, 300, those are 300 years after Mark. Right. You have it used by the apostolic fathers as well, though. Yeah, but you wouldn't, you wouldn't say that some ruling today by the Methodist Church or by the Catholic, by the say the Methodist Church, you wouldn't say some ruling of the Methodist Church today in the early 21st century shows what Methodists were thinking in the early 18th century. Granted, you're right, but I'm talking so about... What evidence, is there in the first, what evidence is there in the first century that followers of Jesus thought Judith was canonical? Well, example, I think there's... Where is, it, where, the it, where is it quoted followers. in the New Testament, for example? Mark 9, 48. I no, can probably get many more. Judith? No, you're saying, no, you're saying he alluded to Judith, and I'm not, I'm not right. conceding the point. Although I'm happy to look it up in Greek with you if you want to look at the Greek together. Sure. Um, it's nice. Mark 9, 48. Yeah, I think the issue would be this. I agree. That's referring to that's Isaiah. That's that's straight out of Isaiah 64. Right, but you also have apostolic fathers that, when quoting Judith, made the connection that Mark was referring to Judith. The language Which apostolic is apostolic father. Um, um I, I, it wasn't as you know, Polycarp. As you know, I, it wasn't I, Polycarp. Uh, as you I know, it was Clement of Rome. I, I don't recall who it was. Uh, look, as you know, I. I am a translator of the Apostolic Fathers. I, I published a two-volume work to translate the Apostolic Fathers. Correct. And just uh, it's been some years now, but I don't remember anybody saying anything. I can tell you this: there is no Apostolic Father that says that Mark got something from Judith. Okay. Because there's no if, Apostolic Father that refers to Mark as a gospel. If I could, if I could make a list of Apostolic Fathers that quoted from Judith, and pre-Nicene Fathers that quoted and hearken to Judith as being holy writ, what would you respond to that? I understand you've translated the Apostolic Fathers before, but it would, would it not be fair if we have an early father quoting something specifically from Judith and calling that holy writ? There's no Apostolic Father who does that. Is there any pre-Nicene Father that does that? You mean 200 years after the Apostolic Fathers? No, I mean, I, I do think that there are some Apostolic Fathers that do do that. Maybe the Apostolic two, Fathers is a technical term the Apostolic Fathers is a technical term for 11 proto-Orthodox authors writing, Correct. writing in the second century. Um, none of them refer to Judith. To my knowledge, uh, I can't think. Uh, does Irenaeus or Tertullian? I don't think yes. they refer to Judith. Do they? Yeah, or, Irenaeus definitely refers to Judith and Baruch as well. That's correct. Uh, by name, calls him Judith. No, no. The problem is I'm not saying that when the Apostolic Fathers or the Nicene Fathers are talking about these books, they need to mention them by name, but they hearken to them and they say, as Holy Writ says, that's what I'm talking about. Give me a about. reference in Irenaeus, because I'm not... Uh... I, I don't have it off the top of my hand. Before the show ends, I'll, I'll pull it up. And I'm positive, I, I don't have it with me, but I know for a fact the Apostolic Fathers do quote from Judith. No, I'm, I'm telling you, the, yeah, the Apostolic Fathers never mention Judith. Okay, well, it, it, if, if I look it up, and I find something from Judith. Find it. I've got my, okay. I've got, I've got texts here. I've got Irenaeus. I've got Tertullian. I've got uh, Ignatius. If, if you prove me wrong, I'll be, I'm happy to be proved wrong because that would okay. be interesting. Huh. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah, that would be very interesting. Well, ba back to my original question though. You say that it can be denied that the early church viewed Judith as holy writ. I guess, let, let me kind of turn the question around. Are you aware of any council when the church gathered and listed scripture that did not include Judith as being part of the canon? Um, yes. Which one? Which one? None of the, none of the ecumenical councils at all gave a list of the canonical scriptures. Th that's incorrect. Uh, Florence didn't, so did Trent. Th those are considered ecumenical. Oh, you mean in the 16th century? Right, but I'm talking about early, yes. early. Okay. I'm talking yes. about By the, the 16th, early ones. Right, right. By the 16th century, Catholics considered Judith part of the canon. That's right. Okay, yes. local. But, but I thought you were talking about Mark, who was written in the year 70, right? Which but is local, uh, 1500 years earlier. <laughs> right, but local councils, when they gathered, when the church gathered, such as at Rome, Carthage, and Hippo, when local councils gathered and they they talked about scripture, did any of them? 
in the earliest times, even if it would have been the 300s, did any of them ever not include Judith as part of their Bible? Uh, remind me, does, does Athanasius included in his list of scriptures? Um, I do not recall. Uh, it's in his 39th list, canon. Um, yep. So it's I, I don't recall. Letter. Yeah, okay. Uh, but, I would but, argue Athanasius you know, I, doesn't I, use I, canon. The way we I just, can. I just, I, I'm not sure I quite understand the question because if hundreds of years later, people consider it to be canon, I don't understand what that bearing that has on what Mark had to say in the year 70. Oh well, I think it has a lot to bear because I think if we look at Mark, I think it's very clear Mark is hearkening to that. But if you disagree, that's fine. If you disagree, that's fine. I just because want to know. The one reference you've given me is a quotation from Isaiah 66. Okay. So, 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 so uh, you know, as you know, Isaiah is quoted all over the map in, in, the, in the New Testament. Right. Uh, and so, uh, I mean, I, I can probably come up with a list here very quickly about how many times uh, uh, Isaiah is referred to, whereas uh, Judith, Possibly, uh, there are a couple places that might be a reference to Judith. The only one that scholars seem to be possibly uh, uh, thinking he might actually be quoting is Matthew 9.36, mm -hmm. uh, which probably is not about heaven and hell. <laughs> so, so, well, so. I, I have no problem if we disagree with whether or not Judith was viewed as holy written in the early church. I have no problem with that. I'm just curious, and you can say, you know what, no, you're wrong or, or whatever. Is it possible that Judith is talking about an eternal kind of torment where, where the actual person is going to be suffering eternally? It's possible. I, as I said, I haven't studied the passage, but it's possible because, as I said, there are, there are Jews who thought that. Yeah. My point is that Jesus didn't think that. Yeah, I, th I think you bring up a really good point. It, it gets to the heart of the issue. So many people always ask, well, what did the ancient Jews believe? You're right about that, Bart. There's such a, a, a bevy of different views. I, I encounter that a lot, and I mean, I'm just blown away that people don't realize that. You, you, you mentioned um, Polycarp earlier. You said Polycarp never, never quoted from John. Do, would you, I know he doesn't quote from the Gospel of John, would you admit it as evidence, though, that he does quote from First John and Third John, or do you not think uh, the the same author wrote First John or Third John? Well, I'm sure he didn't. The same author didn't write it. Okay. No. Okay. So you wouldn't. And you he wouldn't. doesn't quote it by name, of course. What he does is he refers to he 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 used very similar language about who is the Antichrist, the somebody who denies that Jesus came in the flesh, and so he absolutely knows this tradition found in uh, in First John. Um, I'm curious because you keep you keep saying that sometimes when 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 certain individuals, fathers or authors, are, are clearly quoting something, sometimes they don't quote the name of the book. Do you think that that is that would be needed? Like, if if we go, if we look at Josephus, or if we look at um, any of the Apostolic Fathers or, or Nicene Fathers or what have you, I've noticed a lot of the times they're quoting from something, but they don't always list the book. That's but right. they'll quote it and they'll list it as holy writ. Do you think that's, that's right. still a fair assessment to say if they quote it, we can still get a view that they viewed it as scripture? The reason I say that is because you bring up Athanasius, who has a different canon than anybody. I mean, he's different than Protestants and different than Catholics, different than, than Orthodox. But what I find fascinating from Athanasius is um, he'll leave out some books that I would view as scripture. We call them Deuter canon, as you, you, you know very well. But then later, if you look at his 40th festal letter, and if you look at his letter to Marcellinus, he'll quote books that he didn't include in the canon as holy writ. What, what, do, we, what do we make of that? Uh, I don't think he calls them holy writ, but he, he does. He says, as the scripture says, and he, he mentions Baruch, and he does it for um, wisdom as well in his 40th festal letter. So I, I don't just bring up books that he quotes, but he'll call them scripture. Um. It's complicated because you actually have to look very close at what he says in his original language. And so that's, right. that's, part, of, that's part of the problem. When, when you say that if somebody quotes the Bible, doesn't refer to the book, but thinks of that therefore isn't it scripture. What I would say is that um, if somebody says to you, you should love your neighbor as yourself. 
that person has not necessarily read the Gospel of Matthew. And they may not have, they may not know where it even comes from. It's a, it's a saying that people, that is, that is, has been so important in this tradition that people say it without making a comment on the stat, canonical status. So uh, just as a counter example to that, I, uh, I have had a lot of people uh, tell me that um, God helps those who help themselves because that's what the Bible says. Right. So they don't they don't know actually what the source is because that's that's actually not in the Bible. But um, but so the fact that somebody says something doesn't indicate that they think it, it's in a particular book or not in a particular book, let alone whether they think that book is part of the canon or not. Mm-hmm. See what I mean? So that when a later when a later person says something that is like what you find in the canon, it may be that they read the book. Uh, they think it's part of the canon. And therefore, they're quoting it as an authority. It may be that they've heard somebody else quote the saying, and they they like the saying, and so then they quote it. It may be it's just something they heard someplace. It may yeah. be something that they've misheard someplace. And so, unless so, it's very tricky trying to establish what does an author think is part of the canon of the New Testament, and I unless agree. they come out and tell you. Uh, that this is the canon, like Athanasius does in his uh, in his uh, festal letter, where he where he says these are the books of the New Testament, and he lists our twenty seven books. So there you've got it. You've got you've got a list. But if but you know elsewhere he will quote the Shepherd of Hermas, for example. Sure. Athanasius will, well, and yeah. he seems to quote it like scripture, but he yeah, doesn't. I agree. He explicitly no, I agree does you. not include it in his canon. I, I agree with you. Yeah, which which makes me wonder. I think that the great point you bring up there, uh, Dr. Ehrman, and, and I think it's a point that is, is really at times made us made me wonder, what does the early father mean when he talks about something being canon? And again, I'm going to say, you're right. Simply because a father will quote from a book, it doesn't mean that it was canonical to them or, or, or holy writ. I can use the same example from um, Jude that quotes Enoch. Um, yeah. I mean, it would right. work against my position. So I, I agree with you in that regard. But when I'm referring to Athanasius and certain other fathers, I don't mean they merely quote them. I mean, they quote them and before quoting them, they say, as scripture says, or as holy writ says. And I've always been confounded as to why does Athanasius say canon? And then he'll continue later in his life quoting books that he didn't include in the canon, but he yeah. considered to be holy writ. I've always been fascinated by that. Well, so let me tell you what a lot of scholars think, and yeah. um, which is that the term canon and yeah. the term scripture are not coterminous. Yes, I agree with you 100%. Meaning that, that yeah. something can be understood to be uh, some kind of authoritative scripture without being in the canon. Yeah, it I agree 100%. Weird, yeah. Especially if it seems weird to Protestants, but, uh, but yeah. that, that does seem to be the case. I, I agree with you, Dr. Herman. I think, in fact, I think that's a groundbreaking statement you make because it's true. You're right. And I've gathered that from reading stuff that you've written before. I've gathered that from talking to a friend of yours, by the way. We had him on a few days ago, uh, Bob Price, who would uh-huh, you had Bob yeah. Price on. Okay, yeah. yeah Bob Pri- Bob How Price much did you agree with him? <laughs> uh, well, well, I'll tell you one thing. I agree with him more on the canon than I do with you. Bob, <laughs> Bob, Bob Price will agree. <laughs> He'll agree that Judith was was considered holy writ early in the church. Of course, he doesn't believe any of the books are divinely inspired. Uh, I, so I, I have no problem with people considering Judith the holy writ. I just don't think I don't think we have evidence for that early in the earliest church. Right, but you will at least admit that even if they're not considered ecumenical, the earliest councils, whether they be local or not, always included Judith. I don't know. Well, it's there. It's there at Council of Rome, Hippo and Carthage. Okay. Okay. Um, in in your book, you, you, I love the fact that you talked about purgatory, Doctor Ehrman. I just want want to pick your brain a little bit on that before I hop yeah. in over there. Right. Because I'll say this, Doctor Ehrman, I, I've read a lot of books um, that talk about the afterlife, but they'll never delve into purgatory. I am I'm curious. Do you think that purgatory was an ancient belief in the faith, not not whether or not you believe it's real or not. Do you think it was an ancient belief in the early in the early church? No, you do not. Absolutely, okay. absolutely not. 
It you say in your not. book that it was very, very early. How early would you put it? No, no, I don't. Th- I don't say that. What I say is that so the, the term purgatory itself was not invented until the 12th century. Right. The doctrine of purgatory did not become an official doctrine of the church until the 13th century. And so what I do in my book is I show that. So so just so people understand, we're, we're talking about something very specific here. Mm-hmm. We're talking about a, a third place. Um, and so you get um, you get heaven for the for those who are going to be blessed forever. You get hell for those who are going to be tormented forever. And in the Middle Ages, people started imagining a third place, which would be a place for people who are eventually going to go to heaven, but they had to pay for their sins first. And so purgatory in the doctrine is that place that exists for people who are eventually going to be saved, but they have to pay for their sins first. Did that exist in the early church? The answer is no, it did not exist in the early church. What did exist was the idea that some people who are being punished now could end up going to heaven. Uh, And so that 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 exists. But the idea that there's a place where people are gathered together to pay for their sins before going to heaven, no, it did not exist. Okay. Um, I have I have many other questions for you, Doctor Ehrman. You, you've been excellent. I want to pass it over to to Eric. Well, these, are, I don't, I don't great, no, great, great. These are great questions. Thank you. And you know, I I, I hope you like lively exchange I, I, much I, I, lively because this sounds like my life. <laughs> despite, despite the fact that we got a little lively talking about the canon, I respect your work immensely, Doctor Ehrman. I just well, I uh, respect your I, I respect your idea. This is. No, I, so I mean no disrespect to anybody. I just love I love a good argument. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, well, well, you talk to Eric. I'm going to do a little bit of hunting for Judith. Yeah, yeah hunt, hunt for Judith. Hunt for Judith <laughs> in the first two centuries. <laughs> Eric. Dr. Ehrman, thank you so much for coming on again. Um, this is, uh, you know, we're trying to create a platform here that uh, offers something new to the public. You don't really get this quite often, and and so we've we've got a lot of people viewing right now. So I really appreciate you taking uh, your Saturday to give, give us this time. Um, I do have a question. The uh, part of the gospel where uh, I believe this is in uh, it's recorded in uh, the gospel according to Matthew or Luke. I, I forget. It's not. It's definitely not Mark where Moses and Elijah come and speak with Jesus, would you say that that is more or less like an apparition, but not corresponding to a real afterlife of Moses and Elijah? Um, Or would you say that that's actually Moses and Elijah, but temporarily put into a body form, and then they went back to, to the state of being dead? My God, you guys have great questions. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So uh, it is in Mark, actually. It's in Mark chapter nine. Uh, it's in it's in all three of it's in all three of the Gospels. The Transfiguration scene. Uh, the important background to this is going to be one thing that most people know, and one thing that a lot of people don't know. The one thing most people know is that Elijah never died. Uh, Elijah was taken to heaven. Um, so there are two people in the Old Testament who are taken direct, direct to heaven without dying: Enoch and Elijah. And I, I shouldn't say without dying because nobody goes to heaven in the Old Testament when they die. <laughs> that's that's not part of the Old Testament. Elijah and Enoch are Enoch is a more of an ambiguous case because it's a very fuzzy little verse. It's hard to know exactly what it's saying, but it's usually interpreted to mean that God took, took Enoch up to the heavenly realm. And that in the, Elijah's case, it's quite clear uh, in in Kings that he's he's taken up in a fire chariot without dying. He goes up. Uh, to, to live with God, which in the ancient world, uh, broadly in the ancient world, is how God, one of the gods, would honor somebody that they really they really honored. They would take them up to live with them. So Elijah didn't die. Uh, there are traditions that Moses didn't die either. Um, and that what happened was, uh, even though it says in Deuteronomy that he died, actually, you know, but it says that his, his grave was never found, they developed traditions that actually Moses never died either. And so when Moses and Elijah show up to talk to Jesus, these are two people who haven't died yet. So they're not given a temporary body. They're not living now after okay. they die. They're two people who haven't died. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Um, of course, 
uh, I hope you don't mind. I do have, I, I am skeptical of that view, but it's, it's uh, not entirely implausible. Well, you're, so you I can't be skeptical that. about Elijah because um, the Bible says it. <laughs> well, yeah, and as, what I and mean as to is, Moses, I mean, uh, Moses. there's not a lot of question about that, I don't think. I mean, if you look at right. the tradition about Moses. Right. Now, um, how about the uh, story of the rich man and Lazarus um, where, you know, not only are we just given a, a picture of people in a post-mortem state, Probably, it's probably talking about. Um, I mean, it's, it's it's possible that Jesus is just giving a uh, a story to correspond to the eschatological material of of the you know the eschaton and uh, the you know the the punishment that you're going to receive bodily. Which, by the way, um, I'm a Catholic um, as well, and I I do appreciate some of those observations that you have about. Uh, the New Testament and the Old Testament, when it talks about uh, the afterlife, it's really talking about the eschatological material of a kingdom and, you know, a physical a physical breaking in to where we are. Um, and what we find a lot in, in Protestantism, and we had it in, you know, in, in, in Catholicism as well, uh, this this it was just prem it, it became instinctive to just think of heaven as the place where you go when your body dies right now yeah. whereas um the ancients were always thinking about something that would happen here on the earth at the close of human history and it would be real but in any case um would you say that this postmortem story uh of uh the rich man and Lazarus is not talking about an intermediate state, but a real eschatological story to make a point. It's um, it's a complicated story. It is the one pass. You know, I obviously, as you know, I I devoted a long discussion to it in my in my book because it's such an important uh, and interesting story. It's the one story in the New Testament where Jesus is said to embrace the idea that after death. Uh, people will be, uh, their souls will be punished. Uh, the, the, there'll be torment, that there'll be torment for uh, for people who, after they die. It's, this is the one place. And so that's why it's such an important uh, place because Jesus doesn't say that anywhere else. Uh, and so several things to say about the passage. The first thing to be said is that it's a parable. We know it's a parable because it's in a long string of parables in the Gospel of Luke. It's only, you know, in the New Testament, it's only found in Luke chapter 16. It's in a long string of parables, and it begins like a number of the other parables right in, right next to it, which is uh, there was a certain man. <laughs> and like, it's the same words in Greek to start all of these parables, and so this is a parable, which means he's not giving a literal description of what happens after death. He's telling a story. First thing to point. Um, the rich man is uh, being punished in hell. The uh, Lazarus, the poor man, is being uh, rewarded up in Abraham's bosom. Uh, so it's not quite clear uh, what that is, although there's a long history of interpretation of it. But it looks like Lazarus is up there enjoying a feast with the patriarchs uh, up in the heavenly realm. And there's a chasm between the two. And so... Lazarus cannot come down to help the rich man, and the rich man cannot go up to see Lazarus, and they're they're stuck there, one being rewarded, one being punished. The text never says that this is eternal. It never says this is what's happening eternally. And some some interpreters have said this is what's happening in the meantime before the resurrection, and others have said this is the permanent state. Um, my view of this uh, is that not only is it a parable. And uh, not as, only is it unclear whether this is eternal or an interim state, this is a parable that Jesus did not tell. Uh, this is one of those passages that almost certainly was put on his lips by his later followers to illustrate their later point that there's going to be that the soul is going to survive death. That became the later Christian view, as you're pointing out. Uh, it wasn't the original. The, old, the earliest Christian view was a resurrection of dead bodies. But eventually, uh, the idea of resurrection of dead bodies is a Jewish view coming from, from Daniel. 
uh, the book of Daniel 12 that we talked about earlier, is the idea that people will be raised from the dead bodily. This is the view of Jesus, of John the Baptist, of Paul, the earliest Christians. That was the view, not that your soul would die and go one place or another. But as time went on, Christians and people converting into Christianity were almost exclusively from Gentile backgrounds, not Jewish backgrounds. And Gentiles, by and large, had a different view. They thought the soul did live on forever because this was the teaching of Greek philosophy going at least back to Plato. And so when pagans converted to Christianity, they just assumed the soul lived on. Well, if it lives on, then that means it must be rewarded or punished. And if it's rewarded, it goes to heaven. If it's punished, it goes to hell. And so Luke is already in the midst of this where people are thinking the life goes on and it's a view that the soul goes on. And it's a view that Jesus did not have. So I do think it teaches eternal, I think it does teach punishment. I don't know if it teaches eternal punishment, but I firmly don't think Jesus said it. And there's reasons within the story itself to think that Jesus didn't say it. Yeah, that's, uh, that's interesting. Um, you know, it's, it's, it, I want to say that it's, uh, you know, it's, it's definitely something to consider. Uh, my personal view would be that while it is a parable, um, when the rich man requests to go back, to tell his relatives or his, you know, his acquaintances, his friends uh, about the place. Um, I think that that would, I think that if there's no correspondent to that, the parable kind of breaks down. Um, but it's not necessarily broken down because parables, there's a wide, the, the, you know, parables are wide, you know, I mean, they could, they could mean vast different things, but I, my own personal opinion would be that that element of the story would indicate that there's some correspondence in what there was in belief by Jesus and the apostles that this was uh, intermediate before the resurrection, um, but uh, not bodily, uh, or in, not ne not necessarily in the body, the the form that the person deceased uh -huh. with. Um, so I, mean, I would probably agree with you if I thought that Jesus told the parable, but I don't think. I don't think it's reflective of Jesus' views because I don't think Jesus told the parable. Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay, I have one more issue here um, with Daniel and Isaiah. Uh, I want to thank you for giving us your interpretation, which I think is plausible, um, uh, about you know the carcasses uh, where the worm does not die and the fire does not quench. I do have a question, though. Uh, the first one is um, everlasting contempt. Uh, or everlasting detest, you know, being detested for forever. Um, that that's compatible with persons that are conscious, and compatible with persons who are just dead and unconscious. So we have two possibilities. Would you at least admit that everlasting contempt could apply to either a conscious state or an unconscious state? What I would say is that uh, that that's right. It could be either one which means it doesn't necessarily mean that people live forever, and which, okay. means, which means you cannot use it to prove that people live forever because right. it doesn't yeah. prove it. Right. It, so, gives, yeah. it gives no evidence one way or the other. Right. In other words, we're left with both options without, a, without, a, without at this point, without any rational preference for one or the other. Uh, but that, but I just, the, the only reason to make that point at all is because one group of people uses it as proof. The other side right. doesn't use right. it as proof. The side that uses it as proof, what I'm saying is it's not proof, and so it can't be used. And so if you want to show that Isaiah believes that people live forever, you cannot use this verse. You've got to go somewhere else. And I don't know right. where else you will. And let, let, let me offer you what I would say, in, in my humble opinion, for why there's a reason to take this as compatible with the traditional Christian view, which is you know the Catholic view today. Um, and I don't, I don't mean to enclose the Catholics apart from everybody else, but you know what I'm trying to say. Um, I just wanted to make sure that conscious and unconscious suffering can both be under the category of contempt, which you agree with. So the next thing I would say, which gives preference to the, the to the Catholic point of view, is that. In Daniel, it says that the souls that are sleeping shall awake, right? So the, this, this will come to be looked at from a 
logical point of view, a, a log if it's logical pl uh, plausibility of an interruption in the dead state to begin with, so that the damned awake only to return to the punishment. And so it, it, to return to the dead state just shortly after that, um, it would seem to me superfluous to, it, to bring up this idea where there's this one spot in time in the future where those who were already dead unconsciously are going to be awoken only to return to the dead state. And so there's really no reason for them to be awoken. I mean, we can come up with reasons for why, you know, you could say, well, they're awoken so that there can be this eschatological announcement that they're damned and they can go through a sheet of fire again and be sifted through some garbage or something and then eventually just go unconscious again. So it, it would seem to me that there's a preference to the traditional Catholic view on logical grounds because it would seem superfluous to interrupt. It would almost be a, a temporary relaxation of the punishment because as you said, the punishment that's everlasting is non-existence. So to bring existence temporarily into the picture would be superfluous, in my opinion, you know, and I'm open to be corrected on that. But I would appreciate what you would think about that. Um, yeah, well, a couple things. One is I think it's almost impossible to imagine what Daniel's entire scenario is because the verse we're talking the passage we're talking about just occurs in a few words and he doesn't explain what he means. And so, you know, we can make inferences, you know, and suggest possibilities for a long time, but it's it's such a short passage. So we, I don't know really, uh, you know, what Daniel has in mind. I would say that you know, we can't say there'd be no reason for this to happen if then we can come up with reasons because then, you know, there might be reasons. They just might not be reasons we agree with. But the fact that you and I disagree about things probably shows that you and I might disagree with Daniel too. <laughs> Daniel might not think it's superfluous, whereas you like we might you, if people disagree. And so, like I don't sure. know. Sure. My my greater interest is actually what Jesus thought, um, because we have a lot more sayings about Jesus about what happens at the judgment than than the couple words in Daniel. And Jesus is, um, is consistent in my view that there is going to be a resurrection, that people will be brought into the kingdom, and that those who are not brought into the kingdom will realize they've been left out and will be agonizing about it. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, and that they will be destroyed. Uh, the word destruction is the one that Jesus regularly uses. Um, it means annihilation. It means it, destruction means being destroyed. It doesn't mean like being waterboarded, you know, or it doesn't mean having, you know, uh, you know, bamboo shoots put under your fingernails, or it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean like having rods of iron stuck in your eye. Destruction means you're destroyed. Right. And that's the term Jesus regularly uses. So he has all of that at the same time that there, that he says nothing about souls living afterwards. He says bodies will be brought back to life. Some will enter the kingdom. Some will be massively, really agonized about not getting into the kingdom, and they will be destroyed. And so the only sequence that makes sense to me is that bodies come back to life. Some enter into the kingdom, which is here on earth, and some are brought back in order to recognize the error of their ways, and it's a horrible death, and then they're, they, they go through this terrible death by fire, but then they're gone. Right. So, yeah, um, you know, talking about Jesus and, and just so you know, um, I wasn't trying to present my interpretation of Daniel as the only plausible one. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I recognize that the the interpretation you gave there is plausible. I was just saying for me, even if it's by milligrams, the scale, yeah, yeah. the scale moves over. But yeah. so about Jesus, 
Um, I would want to say that his reference to Gehenna has both a literal referent, but ultimately a spiritual eschatological referent. And the, the reason why I would say that just initially is that in the text of Isaiah, uh, it talks about, you know, the, the ongoing moons and, and the new heavens and the new earth and the, the it, it, you know, life is going to continue going on in a new heavens and a new earth, which is really just the renewal of this one. Um, and they'll be going to see the carcasses of these soul, of these, of these, uh, of those who have transgressed against me. Um, well, it can't be speaking literally because if we're really, if we're going to talk about fires that are literally, you know, artificially made by man in the out in that valley outside of Jerusalem, that's always lighting up these, you know, the garbage and the and the human bodies and things like that. Eventually, those carcasses turn to to, to, to ash, you know. So I, I think that there's something more going on there when it says that the carcasses are part of the eschatological vision. And um, and that ties into what Jesus says in Mark chapter 9, where when he says the fire is not quenched and the worm does not die. Again, this goes back to the, the whole issue. It's plausible to read it as talking about, hey, when your body goes in there, you got 18 minutes of life and you're done. And then the fires continue to go up. It That's plausible. That's a plausible reading. But it's also plausible, and this is where, again, milligrams go over on the scale for me, where Jesus is making a an argument from the greater to the less or from the least to the greater, where if, if you go to heaven with one hand, it's better than going to hell with two hands. Well, first of all, if you're going to an eschatological state of unconscious death, two hands, one hand is really no difference one way or the other. But we could still squeeze it in because it is non-existence, and that's not a preferable uh, state of being. Um, but it would seem as though he's saying that this this fire that does not quench has a function upon the person who chooses to sin. And I would say that the everlasting character of the fire corresponds to the punishment which is then tying into why it's better to go to heaven with one hand, one eye, than to go to hell with both. But again, I tell you, it's plausible. Your reading is plausible. Um, but I just wanted to share with you what my position is and maybe your thoughts. And that's all I have, guys. Yeah, so I, uh, right. I mean, you know, you're, the position you're laying out is the traditional position, of course, that people will be punished forever. And um, right, I can see how it would be read that way. Uh, I would just say that it isn't what it says. Uh, and so uh, I, think, I think the hardest thing about reading the Bible is um, putting aside what we've always heard about it and what we've always thought, uh, because it's, it's very hard to read something if you already have ideas about it and not bring those ideas into it. And so what critical scholars try to do is to just kind of bracket everything they've heard and look very closely at the, what the words actually say and to see if there are places in the ancient world at about the same time, preferably by the same author. If the same author uses the words in places where it's unambiguous, then you can use those to try help you understand places that are uh, that are ambiguous. And you just you 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 do historical study rather than uh, assuming that it's saying what you've always thought it said. Uh, and um, I always thought it said what you're saying. I mean, I just always thought it meant that people are going to be pun punished forever. But when I started looking at it closely, uh, without prejudice, uh, I tried not to be prejudiced. It's not like I, I don't have a vet, I don't have an investment in this. I mean, I just want to know what, the, what it says. I mean, uh, you know, I try to read the Bible the way I try to read Charles Dickens. Or, sure. or I just, I try to understand what, what he's saying. And um, without assuming that he's saying what I always thought he said, and I just think if you do that, that uh, my my sense of it probably is it's not saying that the worm is going to be hurting people forever because it doesn't say that. It says the worm is going to exist forever, just as it says that the smoke over Edom is going to go on forever. And I don't think that I think that's a metaphor too. It doesn't mean that the smoke is still there. It doesn't. That isn't what it means. And so. 
So that that's the analogy that, that I would make. Okay, but anyway, thanks. I appreciate I appreciate your comment. Dr. Ehrman, I, I have a, an, another question here. You know, when we look at the second and third century practice of, of some Christians, at least, it appears that what they would do, of course, is celebrate mass over the uh, tombs or over the graves of the martyrs. And it appears that this is perhaps a practice that derived from the book of Revelation, chapter 6. Now, in that chapter, it's curious because we see there the martyrs that are underneath the throne of heaven, if you will, the altar in heaven. Uh, the martyrs there under the throne, it, it, it says, according to the text, cry out how long and, and so on and so forth. So it appears, according to the writer of the book of Revelation, that these martyrs are conscious at, at that time. Would you say that this is perhaps just kind of poetic or that this was something um, that was just developed later after Jesus? And if so, wh where exactly did the writer of the book of Revelation get this idea of a uh, of consciousness for the martyrs? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I don't think there's any evidence in Revelation that they were celebrating a Eucharist uh, at the place of the martyrs. And it's kind of hard to find, really, in the second century. There, there might, yeah. But anyway, so, that, but that, that isn't relevant to your question so much. Um, it's interesting how, in the early church, that passage was in, interpreted. Um, people like Tertullian, for example, thought that what happened was... Um, when people die, they go into a kind of an interim state, uh, kind of soul sleep. I think people sometimes call it, where you you're just kind of unconscious for a while until until the end comes. And Tertullian thought that was true of everybody except for the martyrs. Martyrs were special. Uh, they're obviously special, and since they're obviously special, they are given a place up in heaven uh, right away. They don't have to wait uh, for the resurrection, and so that's how that was originally interpreted it was never interpreted early on as a reference to people generally uh living on after the death the martyrs were exceptional where did that idea come from well it probably comes from the maccabean literature um because you you it's where you start getting this idea that um uh that after death there come there come rewards and it's kind of it's kind of a logical progression when you think about it because in the uh, in the old in the Old Testament, people die, and that's the end of the story. You go to Sheol, and Sheol isn't, you know, there's nothing there. It's like it's like the grave. You're in the pit, and it's you're dead, and it's like there's nothing going on. But it doesn't seem really fair because if you are um, if you're a righteous person and you follow God's Torah and you try to be good to other people and you keep what God tells you to do and you live a miserable life, you're starving to death most of the time, and you're racked with disease, and it's like but you're being faithful and you die and that's the end of the story. Well, that's not right. I mean, you know, there's got to, I mean, God's going to be just and certainly he's just, and there's got to be something afterwards. And, you know, whereas if you're a miserable schmuck who is like this tyrant, who's filthy rich and gets everything he wants and just burns everybody he can to advance his own purpose and he dies and gets away with it, that's not right either. And so there develops the idea that there has to be some kind of justice and who who is the most righteous the one who dies for the torah the one who dies for their faith and then in christianity same things when you die for christ and so the idea is you get a special reward uh before the resurrection you're you give this special thing so that, that's probably where the idea comes from now i want to shift gears with uh two brief questions and then I'll, we're going to go to some chat questions so everybody in the chat go ahead and start preparing your questions uh send them to at reason in theology so i can uh, pick them out quickly um so dr airman returning back to your book you at one point are discussing the death of socrates and and I, I love reading about Socrates, but especially his his death there. Now, of course, we, we know that he uh, was very honorable in what he did, even if we might not uh, agree with him drinking the hemlock there. But uh, he, he seemed to believe that he was doing this for a greater sense of justice. At least that's my, my impression. Do you see perhaps any parallels between the death of Socrates and the death of Jesus and what he was doing as a righteous being by laying out his uh, life as a uh, righteous atonement for God's justice? Are, are there some parallels there? Um, so Socrates is, a kind of, is both an interesting and complicated case. Uh, the account of him... Um, so, so there are several dialogues of Plato called the, the together today called the Last Days of Socrates, and um, 
in the, the apologies where he gives his trial. He's at his trial and he explains why he shouldn't be put to death, but if he's put to death, it's okay with him because he thinks death might be better than living anyway, and so he's okay with that. Um, in the Phaedo, he, um, it talks about him drinking the hemlock, and it's about his day-long discussion uh, going into the drinking of the hemlock. And his friends try to convince him not to do it. Um, but he's willing to do it. And, you know, the thing is, uh, you know, I, th I don't think one should have too, I don't think one should be too condemning of Socrates for drinking the hemlock. If he didn't drink the hemlock, they were going to put him to death. Right. And it wasn't probably going to be as simple as just drinking some hemlock. <laughs> it's, it's probably the smarter thing to do. Just to drink but he could hemlock. have escaped. They gave him an opportunity to escape. That's right. But the reason he didn't want to escape is because he knew that if everybody broke the laws of the state, mm -hmm. the state would sink into anarchy. Right. And if the state sank into anarchy, then it would be a disaster. Mm -hmm. Where and so and that's bad. In mm -hmm. Socrates' view, that's bad. Sure. Um, is it bad to die? He doesn't know. He thinks it's look. I'm either I'm either going to be unconscious, which would be fine, and be like a deep dark sleep that goes on forever, and everybody likes having a good sleepless night, and so it's just going to go on forever. That'll be good. Or it'll, I'll, I'll I'll wake up with everybody else who's ever lived, and we'll have conversations for eternity. And Socrates loves that kind of stuff. It's all about discourse. And so there's nothing there's nothing bad about dying, but it is bad to lead the state into anarchy. And so it's kind of about justice, but it's it's really more about doing what is right, no matter what. Now, is that like the gospel tradition? Well, it, you know, it, you, I don't know. We, we don't know what's going on in Jesus, the real Jesus head. We have four accounts of him going to his death. And the four accounts are not all saying the same thing. And they don't they don't understand it in the same way. But in basic terms, Jesus thought that by dying, it would be better for other people. And so he was willing to do it. Uh, and so roughly speaking, that is similar to Socrates. He thought it would be better for other people uh, to do it than not to do it. Okay. Um, you also talk about the Epic of Gilgamesh, which I was very pleased to see because I, I, I love this story. And of course, it's uh, arguably the the most ancient text that we, well, if you want to call it a text, most ancient story that we have uh, written record of. Now, um, could you maybe explain what, what exactly is the notion of the afterlife or that concept or idea of the afterlife in the Epic of Gilgamesh? Yeah, well, it's not pleasant. Yes. <laughs> so there's only the, Gil the Gilgamesh epic, uh, when it was discovered, caused quite a furor because it contains passages that look very much like the Old Testament, especially the flood of Noah. There's there's a flood story that is very similar in Gilgamesh, and it was certainly written centuries before the Old Testament was. And so, I mean, it's, you know, there's a righteous man, everybody else, the world's going to be destroyed. Uh, the gods tell him to build a big boat. He builds a big boat. He brings in living creatures of every kind, and they, the floods come, kills everybody else. He and the people on the boat survive. And so like, it's like it's, it's Noah's flood, but it's written centuries earlier, and they got people wondering about it. This mm. guy, uh, the, the guy who survives is, is named Utnapishtim, and Utnapishtim is, uh, uh, is the only person who's ever been given immortality. He lives forever. Everybody else dies and basically eats dirt and is eaten by the worms forever, and Gilgamesh knows this because his best friend uh, has died, and he and it drives Gilgamesh nuts. Not because he's upset about his friend, because he's upset because he's going to end up in the dirt too. And so he tries to find the fish to, to tell him how he can live forever as well. And so he tries; it doesn't work. And so, so the basic idea of death is, except for one person, uh, you're down there eating the dirt forever, and uh, yeah, it's not good, not good. So it's all about the. This book is all about the fear of death. And humans uh, attempt to bypass the fear of death. You know, kind of in the same vein, I, I don't know if you had a chance to engage in the book. At least I didn't see it. Um, the Descent of Inanna. Uh, yeah. did, did you in, engage that? And, and yeah, so, I decided that, that uh, 
that I, I went through all of the ancient Near Eastern texts and studied all of them, but I decided for the sake of simplicity and not to bore people with too many ancient Near Eastern myths, <laughs> just to stick to Gilgamesh. <laughs> I, I just found it interesting um, with, with her descent there. Do, do you think that there is some kind of idea of perhaps an eternal uh, conscious afterlife there in the descent of Inanna or uh, uh, I think it's hard to say I mean I think yeah. it's hard to say with all of these myths I mean it's hard to say really with Gilgamesh because it sounds like uh, uh, and Kidu, his best friend, is down there kind of aware of the fact that he's eating dirt <laughs> and, yeah. so, uh, and so it kind of sounds like eternal consciousness it's not clear if they really you know what it's not they, maybe they do mean it and that yeah that would that would be bad because it'd be applying to everybody <laughs> In, indeed uh yeah. well let's go to some chat questions this one look, is look, from, look, I, I, yeah. want, I did want to talk yeah, yeah. something at dr Aaron before we did go to the chat question so dr Aaron, i was able to dig it up in clement of rome chapter 55 where he says the I'm blessings. i'm going to get up and get i'm going to get up and yeah. get my copy yeah. great there we go i'll wait for you to get that copy uh where is my copy Hold on, let me get a different copy. Thank you, time. Okay. Right, go ahead. First Clement 35? No, 55. 55. Yeah. Do you want me to read it to you or you want to? You... I'm going to look it up just to make okay. sure that I know what you're talking about. Right. Okay. Got it. Got it. Okay. okay. If you go, I think we'll... halfway through that chapter, the blessed Judith, when her city was besieged, asked of the elders permission to go forth into the camp of the strangers, exposing herself to danger, uh, yada, yada, yada. Then he proceeds to quote Esther after, but he's quoting directly from Judith 8.30 there. That's right. Uh, well, no, Judith, yeah, 8 through 13, yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, he's producing her as an example of a woman strengthened by the grace of God. Says it more than one right. time uh, with Esther. Yeah. Um, your, your thoughts on that? That's right. That's what he's doing. It, he says nothing about what is canon. He doesn't have a concept. Oh, no, no argument. Oh, no, I don't think he ever, I don't think any of the apostolic fathers really dealt with canon as a whole. My only argument I was trying to make was, to me, it seems like Clement of Rome viewed Judith as holy writ, particularly because he's coupling her, coupling her with Esther and many times saying she was strengthened by the grace of God, an example of godliness. And if you notice, he uses a certain word for her, calling her blessed. He only uses that word for Paul and Moses as well. Uh, you think, I think it's possible that he would have viewed it as holy writ? Do you think that is possible? I don't think he had that category. So I'm not, I'm not sure what your category of holy writ means, but it sounds like you um, mean, I, I mean part of the canonical of scriptures. And I don't uh, think that's, that's – he's not using it as a canonical scripture. He's using it as – he thinks the story happened. Right. He's referring to something that he thinks happened. Right. He's he thinks not, it happened. Not commenting on the canonical status of the book in which it's found. That's a I huge agree. Difference. Yeah, I agree. That would be very anachron anachronistic. I agree with you completely. My only point was, I don't think Clement of Rome had in his mind to sit down and talk about the canon of Scripture. I, I agree with you. I'm just. I think that he believes this truly happened, and yeah. he believed that this was a book that would have been divinely inspired. Can we say that? No. No. Okay. You he, still doesn't won't that. he doesn't talk about a book. He's telling okay. a story that he knows. Okay. Well, I disagree there. But I have something else I want to... But you'd have to, to you'd have to have reasons for disagreeing. I mean, because he doesn't mention... He doesn't say anything about this text. He's telling a story. He's hearkening to... If Judas I tell you a right? story... If I tell you a story that is in common circulation that people know about, it doesn't mean that I'm commenting on the status of the book that, that you originally found it in. Okay. If, if I were to tell you the way I view it, if I were to tell you something that I get from a random book, just I'll use the book, let's pretend it's a random book circulating in the early church, and I begin quoting from it, and I say, this is from God. This woman was strengthened by God. This is godliness. I would be referring to that as something that is divinely divine truth. I think that is the way Clement of Rome clearly viewed Judith. He couples it with Esther. I don't think he had in his mind what later Christians would talk about as being canon. I don't think many of the apostolic fathers had that. My only okay. argument hey, is... Let me ask this. Let me yeah. ask you this. When uh, in the book of Acts, the Apostle Paul quotes the uh, 
Greek pagan uh, writer Aratus. He quotes, yes, that's correct. Do you I think, don't believe that is canonical. No. I well, don't believe. But, but by your argument, no. if he is, by your, I'm just, I'm saying your argument is if somebody quotes a book favorably, they understand it to be holy writ. That's what no. you said about Judith. And I'm saying if you say that about Judith, then you need to say that the author of the book of Acts understood Aratus to be canonical scripture. I don't think quotation equals canonical. I think depending how they quote the work, what they say about the work, that could lead us to believe whether or not he believed it to be holy writ. And I think by the virtue of him saying she was strengthened by God, calls this godliness, I think he did believe. And then he couples it with the, the kind of the proto-canonical Esther. How do, you, he, how do you contrast that with what happens in the book of Acts? Where, for example, in the book of Acts, we appear to have quotations of Euripides as yes. well and Aratus. And these are not, uh, the quotations are not condemned. They're quoted because they're authorities. Correct. But nobody would say that the author thought, therefore, Euripides was wholly writ. But you're saying that it does apply to Judith. But, you know, it's not an accident that Judith happens to be in your canon mm -hmm. and Euripides does not, even though it's the same phenomenon. Even though I just said, I don't think quotation equals canon. I don't think everything merely you quoted said the affirmation. Canon. The affirmation of a text that you were citing shows you that you consider it to be authoritative. No, I think the language that Clement of Rome uses when he's talking about Judith shows that he believed it to be divine writ, holy yes, writ. I know you're saying that. And I'm saying by that standard, Luke understands Aratus to be divine writ. Does Luke say Aratus is divinely inspired? Does, does Clement say that Judith is divinely inspired? Strengthened by the grace of God. I think that he would believe. No, no, no. That, he's talking about Judith. He's not talking about the book. He's talking about the woman Judith was strengthened by God. Right. And words, then he he's quotes a, the he's book. Affirming, he's affirming what's in the book. Luke, so he, Luke he would is have affirming affirmed. what's in Aratus. So he would have affirmed what's in the book, but not. But he would have affirmed what is in the book, believed it to have been from God but not believed it to have been holy written. William, I'm just confused, William, Mark. You're just, you're just arguing for your theological view. You're not well, arguing on a historical basis. You're just saying what you believe. And that's well, it's I, fine. You're welcome to believe it. But this passage does not prove it. This passage just shows that he knows a story about Judith, and he thinks it has happened. It's got nothing to do. I mean, you can say this about First Clement. You can quote something in First Clement and say, yes, I think that happened. It doesn't mean that you think First Clement is part okay. of the Bible. Okay. Uh, I, again, I'll just say I don't think quotation equals canonicity. I agree with you on that. Let, <laughs> let, me, let me toss something else in. You. you may say that, but that is what you're saying about Judith. I, I disagree completely. I, I, I showed you how he views Judith as a very important figure in line with Moses and Paul, who were proto-canonical figures we agree with. He uses a word for her that he only uses for Paul and Moses. I think it's very significant. But we, we're going to disagree. We're going to disagree no matter what. So, I don't mind disagree, but I mean, like, you know, it, stating your case over and over again isn't an argument. <laughs> you, I mean, okay. It's, <laughs> okay, I all right. Yeah, okay, your other but let, let me toss you uh, this other one. Um, we clearly disagree on that. Jerome, in his prologue to Judith, he says that Judith was found by the Council of Nicaea to have been counted among the books of the sacred scriptures. What do you have to say about that? Uh, well, I think Jerome certainly did see it as scripture. Right, I but mean, he says that Nicaea included it as holy writ. Well, um, you asked for an ecumenical council. Yes, you know we do have the proceedings from the Council of Nicaea. Correct. I'm I'm aware of that. Yeah. Do they talk about Judith being canonical? I have never ever once seen it. It's not there. Do you think that we have the Acta of Nicaea? You know, we don't have the Acta of Nicaea. We have we have what they decided. Yeah, but we don't have the acta. There's several councils where we don't have the acta. Well, Jerome is saying that they they made a decision about it. Correct. And if you we have, don't have the acta, it would be possible that maybe it was lost to history. Yeah, well, maybe. But you know, Jerome is writing uh, around the year 400, so he's talking about something that happened 75 years earlier. Well, he and lived during the Arian crisis, right? No. Well, he <laughs> didn't live during. 
Well, he, wasn't alive, said. he wasn't alive in 325, no. No, but the Aryan crisis went on for a while. Remember his famous quote? The yes. whole world woke up and he... No, no, I know, like, Aryan, I know when Jerome you know. was living. Yeah. He, are you saying where there's still Aryans in the world when Jerome was there? Yes, but I thought you were yes. asking about the Council of Nicaea. No. But Jerome does say... It's like asking, you know, if, somebody, if democracy is still going on and we're alive with democracy, do we know what happened, uh, you know, at the Declaration of Independence? No. I mean, it's still democracy still going on. Arianism was going on, but it has no relevance to what happened at the Council of Nicaea. So you're saying that for certain, you know, Judith would not have been counted among Holy Writ at Nicaea. What I'm saying is Nicaea did not discuss which book would be Holy Writ. Okay. And, and we know that? Yes. How, how, do, how do we know that? Uh, I already told you how. We have their decisions. We have what they talked about and what their decisions were written at the time, not 75 years later by somebody who hadn't been born yet. Okay. Um, well, I think that was a, a great answer. Uh, despite <laughs> us disagreeing, I disagree greatly. But we, it's fine still, to disagree. Where would we, we have, be if we all agreed? You, we have the right. canons. It would be a fun so. world. We'd, be hey. all, we'd all be Catholic. <laughs> we uh, should be all Catholic. Let, exactly. let me uh, <laughs> ask a few follow-up questions here. Dr. Airman, we have the canons of Nicaea, but we don't have the act of the first few ecumenical councils. Yeah, we, we don't, don't have exactly, the act of no, I'm not saying uh, we have the act of. We have right, the right. So personally, I don't think Nicaea decided the canon, but um, we, we don't know exactly what all they said. Now, I think if they were to have decided the canon, that would be in the canons mm -hmm. that they uh, actually be. did promulgate. And so. we don't know all they said, but everything they yeah. said wasn't a decision. In other yeah. words, the council I see yeah. had hundreds of people there. Right. They were saying all sorts of stuff. Right. So yes, right. we we do not have a stenographic report of what yeah. they, what everyone said. Yes, we do not. Yeah. Have. Well, I agree. It, my, my my only point in, in, in bringing that up was to just show that even an ecumenical council, we have evidence that even an ecumenical council counted it as holy writ. That was the only reason I brought it up. I don't think but, they can. But we don't. The we don't have evidence. I mean, yes, we have somebody. We have the Jerome. We don't have the Council of Nicaea saying that. Correct. We don't. And your original point was about the Gospel of Mark, which was written in the year 70. Yes. Rome is writing around the year 400. We do not use uh, statements written today to refer to things that happened 330 years ago mm -hmm. uh, when they're not even talking about those things. Jerome is not talking about the Gospel of Mark. Oh, Mark was three hundred thirty 30 years earlier. Oh, I, I grant it's that. It's not a relevant my, argument. My only point, my main point was that Judith was considered holy writ in the early church. I wasn't connecting that to Mark. Early church? It's like saying that, you know, it's illegal to perform abortion in uh, colonial America. Well, you, you did it agree with me. Maybe, but you have to look at the evidence for it. You can't say because it's, illegal, agree. it's illegal in the year 2000, whatever, that, it, that it's illegal then. You look at the evidence, then, and when you say the early church, it's like saying the history of America. The, the early church lasts for hundreds of years. Yeah, and so right. what happens at the end of that period has no relevance. So you can't use the early church to say what somebody thought in the year 70. I agree with you completely, which is why I think it's amazing that once we get to the early councils, when they begin to canonize scripture, every single one does include the book of Judith. To me, that None show... of the councils canonized scripture until the Council of Trent in the 16th century. You're incorrect, because Florence did. Council of Florence canonized scripture. All right. Trent okay. argued to Florence. But, but I was talking about early local councils. They still talked about the Bible. What year is the, what year is the Council of Florence? It was in the 1400s. Right, 15th century. So... Right. You're talking about before the Trent. Mark in the year in the first century. I'm, I'm talking, talking about, about Judas. Yes, you're talking about whether in the earliest Christian communities of the first century it was considered scripture. And your evidence is a council that met 1300 years later. No, I'm saying the early church, when they gathered together in council, they never gathered in the first, three, first 200 years, Bart. When they finally gather together, when <laughs> that's they finally my gather point. Together, yeah, when they finally hundreds gather of together, years later, hundreds of years later, they considered it scripture. Yes, hundreds of years later, they canonized it as scripture. But no. before that, it was being used. Nobody as, canonized it as scripture until what did, what did Rome do? What did the Council of Rome in the three eighties do? What do you mean by canonized? Do you mean somebody recognized it as being part of scripture? A council gathered 
headed by Pope Damasus and said, this is part of Holy Writ. It was part of the Old Testament. It w- That's very the significant point, evidence. The point, the point of talking about the seven ecumenical councils is that they were not local variations. Right. I'm not arguing local that the seven variations. Yes, yeah, there are people around Christianity and groups of people around Christianity who considered certain books to be scripture, who did not consider other books to be scripture. But when you talk about canonizing the Bible, you're talking about a consensus among churches. That requires an ecumenical council, and none of the seven ecumenical councils made any canonical decisions about which books would be in scripture. I I agree. I'm not arguing about the seven ecumenical councils, although I believe you're incorrect. I think Second Nicaea did. Yeah, could I say something? Because Second Nicaea actually, um, of course, accepts the canons of of Trula, which I I believe itself does accept some other canons that accepted these local councils. So in an indirect way, Nicaea too. In an indirect way, but I know that's pretty late. That's not first, second century, you know. yeah, which, is, which is what we're talking about. <laughs> so, can I ask a question about that? Um, the the famed historian J. N. D. Kelly, Protestant historian, he says, "quote In the first two centuries, at any rate, the church seems to have accepted all or most of these additional books, speaking of the Deuterocanonicals, as inspired, and to have treated them without question as scriptures." So, I take it you would disagree with him. Um, where did he get this idea from, though? I don't. I don't. I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what you're asking exactly. Well, are you asking why? Why is this important to, to heaven and hell? Whether there were churches that agreed that the, the deuterocanonical books were actually part of scripture? Well, no. I was. I was just a follow up from y'all's conversation over there. But I mean, <laughs> well, the whole point uh, I, of this has to do with heaven and hell. Sure, sure. But this had to do with Judith, whether or not it's canonical, and it's speaking right. on the matter. So Dandy Kelly's not talking about the New Testament period. Mm-hmm. He's speaking about the Old Testament text, which would include Judith. He's talking about the Deuterocanonicals, which includes Judith, and he's saying in the first two centuries they accepted it, and that's then material to our discussion on what Judith says about hell, or the afterlife, I should say. Um, okay, how would you decide which books a New Testament author accepts as canonical? Mm-hmm. Would you base it on what happens 400 years later? No, I mean, I, I, I understand. Would you base it on what happens 100 years later? Well, my question is, where is J.N.D. Kelly getting this idea that the first two centuries accepted these books as canonical? Where is he? Well, he's probably basing it on the fact that it's in the Septuagint, and the Septuagint was the, was the Bible for the Christians. Okay. All right. So would that not be a good reason why one could perhaps present Judith and Judith's version of the afterlife to say uh, that this is perhaps indicative or reflective of uh, Christians' views of the afterlife in the first, second, uh, well, first so and second wanted, century. Yeah, so if you did want to take that line, what you'd have to say is that the view of Ecclesiastes was mm-hmm. the view of the early Christians, uh, that the the view of Psalms was the view of the Christians, that the book mm-hmm. of Genesis was the view of the Christians, that the book of Daniel was the view of the Christians. And so that's the big problem. The fact that you've got scriptures that have different views, and then you say, so that was the view of the Christians, mm-hmm. is problematic. What we do know is that New Testament authors do frequently quote the books of the Hebrew Bible. They rarely quote the books that are found in the Septuagint. They sometimes uh, th- that are not in the Hebrew Bible. They sometimes quote uh, books that are not uh, deuterocanonical books. They sometimes quote, uh, for example, on these grounds, you'd have to, you know, uh, well, as you know, there's a range of books that get quoted, including pagan works. And so sure. the fact that somebody quotes works doesn't show they consider them to be canonical. Course. Yeah, Jew and the fact quotes that they the assumption, con- sure. The fact that they consider them canonical does not show that they agree with their views of the afterlife. Because mm-hmm. if you say that, then you have to say that they didn't believe in any afterlife because that's what Ecclesiastes says. I, I would disagree with you there. I think that perhaps some of them would have uh, disagreed with the interpretation of Ecclesiastes. But sure, I, I know where you're coming from as far as that interpretation. I don't think that that is the only You're talking about your interpretation of these books. Well, I can talk about the early church, uh, different Christians. I mean, of course, you're, you're going to have different right. uh, figures there. But I don't think that the early Christians all would have, even though they would have accepted Ecclesiastes as canonical and God-breathed, they honest us, I don't think they would necessarily would have taken your position. Would you argue that they did? That they uh, understood the afterlife in the book of Ecclesiastes in the same way that... No, but that was your argument. You're saying since you have a view of the afterlife in Judith, mm-hmm. this would have been their view. 
Well, I'm asking, could this have potentially been a view of some Christians? Potentially? I mean, some Christians might have believed... I mean, some Christians might have believed in 365 gods. Sure. Okay, but we we have no evidence of three hundred sixty five dollars. Oh, we do actually. But, yeah, okay. we do. Yeah, no, we, that's we new to me. I've I've never heard of this. Uh, there's a three hundred and sixty five dogs. Gods. Gods. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> I'm sorry, I misheard. <laughs> I, I thought you were just making dogs. something up there. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were just making something up off the cuff. No, no, okay. no. They they absolutely believed in three hundred sixty five dogs. I I got gotcha. you. Okay. But the Phoebe Knights, the Phoebe Knights, uh, did believe in three hundred sixty five dogs. Yeah, no, I mean, you, oh, yes. you can, Christians did believe sure. Christians believe lots of different things. Right, right. You're you're just not necessarily saying you're just saying it's not necessarily connected to what actually Jesus himself taught. Jesus okay. doesn't teach these things. <laughs> yeah, you're saying Jesus doesn't teach these things. So even though you can Never find some Christians in the first and second, or maybe I'm sorry, in the second and third century, you can find some Christians who believe what appears to be what Catholics or some Protestants believe about the afterlife. It's not necessarily going back to Jesus. That's your main thesis. My my thesis is a little simpler than that, actually. Jesus mm -hmm. absolutely doesn't talk about par uh, about purgatory, which is a Catholic belief. Mm. And so could you say, could he have believed that? Well, I mean, he could have believed in Marxism. I mean, I don't know. He could have believed in anything. But, I mean, is there any evidence that he believes it? No. Right. Uh, did, he believe that, did he believe that your soul would go to heaven or hell? No, he did not. I see what you're saying. Okay, fair enough. I, I think this is something definitely worth pursuing more. I do want to get to the ah. chat questions. I've been keeping um, them waiting for quite a while. Do you have just a moment or, or yeah, not? Not much of a time? moment. So, uh, we're already okay. over, but uh, let's, uh, we can do a couple quickies. Okay, just a couple then. Uh, this one is from Garth. What would you say about the passage in the book of Revelation that talks about the lake of fire and the never-ending suffering there? Yeah, that's a great question. As a, you, know, you all have great questions. So the lake of fire, I, I devoted an entire chapter to the book of Revelation in my book. Uh, and, what I, and I used to think, I mean, until, uh, until you know, like two years ago, I used to think that Revelation did describe the eternal torment of sinners. Uh, but I then went back and actually read the passages closely, and it does not. The lake of fire does exist. Uh, people do get thrown into it but they are not said to live after they were thrown into it. It's the way they're executed. The only three uh, individuals who are, um, who are uh, tortured forever in the lake of fire are the devil, the beast, who is the Antichrist, and his prophet. Uh, these are supernatural, superhuman beings. They're not humans. So humans uh, are not said to uh, suffer forever in the lake of fire in the book of Revelation. But I have a full discussion of that to try and demonstrate it in my, in my chapter. All right, one more. This one is from Elijah. Uh, why would an Al Alexandrian synod in the year 231 excommunicate Origen for his beliefs on hell if the early Christians didn't believe in everlasting torment of hell? Could you give me that question again? I think yeah, I yeah, yeah, absolutely. Let me uh, put it on the screen here. Why would an Alexandrian synod in the year 231 excommunicate Origen for his beliefs on hell if the early Christians didn't believe in everlasting torment of hell? Uh, there wasn't an, okay, there's several. There wasn't an Alexandrian synod in 231 that condemned Origen's uh, beliefs on hell. Um, their Origen was eventually condemned in the 6th century uh, for his doctrine of uh, apocatastasis, but it wasn't because uh, of his belief in, in hell. It was uh, it was his it was we we actually know what Origen was condemned on because we have we actually have re records of what he was condemned on, and um, from from people living at the time, and the condemnation came after the Originist controversy, which started in the, around the year three ninety. Um, but the condemnation, the, the controversy went on for a long time. The condemnation didn't, doesn't come until the 6th century. And the problem with the apocatastasis is not that Origen denies hell. The problem with it is that he thinks that the devil eventually is going to be saved. Um, and for most Christians, this was too much. It'd be kind of like today when Christians say, you know, yeah, everybody's going to get saved, but Hitler ain't. You know, that ain't, that's never going to happen. Only, like, it's that only 10 times worse. They're saying, look, the devil is not going to be saved, and Origen's logic drives him to say that he is going to be saved, and so that's um, that's the problem with uh, that's the problem with Origen. Um, uh, and so it might be loosely connected with with hell, but it, it's a later 
thing. And by that time, of course, uh, most people did believe in hell. I mean, most people were believing in hell in Christian circles by the end of the second century. Um, which is another thesis of my book. So origin, and so yeah, so Christian widely believes in hell, uh, but not 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 Jesus and Paul and the Book of Revelation and all that. My point is about the Bible. They did the, the whole point is it develops into a belief. That's the whole point of my book. It develops into a belief. It's not the original belief. Right. So it's not good enough to go to second century because you're saying there's a gap there between second, late second century Christians and obviously Jesus and, you know, uh, the first century. So well, it just depends a... what you want to ask. I mean, I'm, I'm not asking whether the Catholic doctrine, for example, is true or not. I'm not I'm not dealing with that. Right. I'm not dealing with the issue of what's really there after we die. Right. I'm dealing with the question of where did these ideas come from? Yeah. And do they come from Jesus or do they come from Paul or do they come and I'm arguing that these views are not in the Old Testament. They're not what Jesus preached. They're not what his earliest followers thought. They're later developments. That doesn't make them true or false. I mean, the early Christians also didn't believe in um, in quantum physics or uh, you know in whatever. I mean, they didn't they didn't they didn't believe in the Pythagorean theorem. But I mean, it doesn't mean it's wrong. It just they, yeah. they didn't have that idea. And so um, so that's what my book is about. What did the earliest sure. And, and and these guys in the late second century who did kind of believe in an eternal conscious torment of, of hell, their their idea did it derive from derive from anyone specific or was it just kind yeah. of something that the whole point of my book is that this idea actually is not even though it's not found in the Old Testament, it is found in uh, in Greek thought, uh, especially Plato, mm. uh, and Platonic thought became heavily influential on early Christianity, and the idea of eternal torment. For souls and eternal blessedness for souls comes from Plato, and so it, it, you find you find it in Plato uh, mm. in several several places. And so what happens is, once you have these Greeks who convert to Christianity, they take the teachings that they grew up with, which are the teachings of Greek philosophy, and they take the teachings of Jesus, and they put them together, mm. and that's how you end up then with what, this amalgam which is the Christian teaching of heaven and hell, which wasn't the original Christian teaching, but it's a later development as soon as you get uh, Greek platonic thought brought into it. No, I, I see what you're saying. That's a very interesting theory. I um, I recommend everybody get the book. Again, it's Heaven and Hell, A History of the Afterlife. It's available on Amazon.com. <laughs> Dr. Airman, I want to thank you so much for coming okay. on. This was a very, very wonderful discussion. You're welcome on the show anytime. I'd love to have yeah. you on again. And well, we I don't know maybe... if I survive another one. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, we, we could engage any topic that you would like, but I, it would be an honor to have you on again. I think that would be uh, well, fun, especially if we great. could do a round table. With you. F- five hours on the canon alone. Yeah. <laughs> the canon. Okay, yeah, right, see, the right. canon is a topic that we do a lot, and we. Oh, yeah. It's very dear to me, and I know it yeah, is to William here. and Eric, too. So, there yeah. Here. We'll, we might we'll have some have different opinions that. about it, but yeah. You, you guys are great. It's been, it's well, th- great, th- great th- thank you so much. Uh, put in right. a plug for anything that you're you're doing, oh, or you I want to put in a plug. Yeah. So, so, yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. It was. How am I thinking? So, yeah. Um, if anybody's listening to this, watching this, is interested in the kind of thing we're talking about, um, everything we're talking about, the canon, anything involved in the New Testament, Christianity for the first 400 years, mm. uh, the Old Testament, I have a blog uh, that uh, I'd like people to know about, the Bart Ehrman blog. They can look it up. Um, it is, um, it, we have free memberships available now if people want to check it out during the crisis. Normally, there's a small membership fee. Uh, to join the blog, but uh, the membership fee goes entirely to charities dealing with hunger and homelessness. And so I don't keep a penny. We don't, I, I, we, the, there's no overhead, zero overhead. It is all goes to charity, but you can join now for free uh, mm-hmm. during the crisis. And so, but I talk about everything. People ask me questions. I deal with questions every day. I post five times a week, 12, 1400 words a day. And so, People have access to a ton of stuff. So people should know about that. Just look up the Bart Ehrman blog. Excellent. And I'll, and I'll put in a link to it at the description, Great. everybody, so y'all can check it out there. Once again, thank you so much, Dr. Okay. Ehrman. You're welcome on, on any time. Okay. Everyone, uh, thank you for watching uh, and being engaged in the, in the chat. Put your questions, of course, or your comments in the comment section once this posts. And also join, like, subscribe, all that good stuff. Until next time, God bless you all.